Dear organizers, thanks for the kind invitation. It's a great honor and pleasure to speak at the second international workshop on non-invasive brain stimulation. So I want to give you some insight into the behavioral and neural modeling of NIPS effects in cognition. I declare no conflict of interest, so ready to go. My group is interested in the adaptive plasticity in neural networks for cognition at the systems level. And to investigate this, we combine modeling approaches with mapping of neurostimulation effects after functional neuroimaging or EEG. And I want to give you an overview of and examples of two approaches, how we can um, combine neurostimulation and neuroimaging to map and model such data. So the first approach is the um, subsequent combination of plasticity-inducing neurostimulation with fMRI or EEG to map lasting stimulation after effects. In this illustration, it is shown how we apply virtual lesions with inhibitory TMS and map changes with fMRI at the network level. This approach, we can address the so-called rapid short-term reorganization, that is the response of the brain to a focal perturbation. And this addresses the question how the targeted network, or maybe also other networks, may compensate for a controlled focal perturbation of a neural key region for cognition. We can, of course, also use facilitatory stimulation and map the after effects of such protocols. Now, the second approach is the simultaneous combination of neurostimulation and fMRI or EEG to map the immediate neural correlates of the stimulation effects. What is illustrated here is the simultaneous combination of TDCS with fMRI, which is methodologically relatively easy. I'm sure we'll hear more about the more challenging combinations of, for instance, TMS and fMRI or EEG later. Now, both approaches provide the advantage that we can modulate task-related activity, relate this to changes in task-related interactions or connectivity, and changes at the behavioral level. Now, how can we model such effects at the network level? One way is to use effective connectivity analysis, for instance, dynamic causal modeling, DCM. And the idea here is that we not only invest, investigate these patterns of changes induced by neurostimulation at the um, task-related activity, but also changes in the interaction and the direction of the interaction between the affected regions. So let's assume that as a baseline you have placebo stimulation in, and um, over a certain node in your network, and then you can look at the interactions between this node and other nodes in the network. Now, after TMS, such interactions may change. If we have inhibitory TMS over a key node, this may decrease the contribution of this key node to your given task, illustrated by an arrow pointing downwards here. Now, as a compensatory effort in the network, the contribution of another area may be increased. And at the same time, we may also observe changes in the functional interaction um, between these areas, for instance, the targeted region may change its influence on the other node. The other node may also increase its influence on the stimulated area. So with this, neural modeling with DCM can be used to map NIPS-induced changes really at the network level, not only at the level of activity patterns. I now want to give you an example of such an approach. So in this study here, we were interested in the adaptive plasticity in the semantic network. So we had healthy volunteers perform semantic judgments, natural or man-made decisions during fMRI. And before that, we applied inhibitory TMS as continuous theta burst stimulation over the left angular gyrus, which is a key node for semantic processing. Here's what happened in, on in the task-related activity level. So you can see that TMS decreases the task-related activity, not only in the targeted left angular gyrus, but also in other remote areas of the semantic network, that is anterior IFG, posterior middle temporal gyrus. Now, with dynamic causal modeling, we could show that TMS also influenced the interaction between these areas. Prior to stimulation without TMS or after placebo stimulation, the interaction between angular gyrus and anterior IFG was positive. So this facilitatory interaction turned into an inhibition effect after TMS of the angular gyrus. 
So it seems that TMS of left angular gyrus decreases activity in the semantic network and such inhibition is likely mediated by an increase in the inhibitory connectivity between the targeted area and another relevant node in the semantic network. And interestingly, this really changed the direction of the interaction from positive to negative to a strong inhibition. And finally, we observed that the level of the individual inhibition predicted the individual disruption at the behavioral level. So the stronger the increase in the inhibitory influence from angular gyrus on anterior IFG, the stronger the individual TMS-induced response delay. I think that this illustrates that such remote inhibition induced by TMS is behaviorally relevant and explains the behavioral disruption. Now, it should be noted that we did not only observe a decrease in the um, contribution of regions and increases in the inhibitory connectivity, but also an upregulation of other nodes after disruption of the semantic network. And these other nodes are shown in red here and are neighboring areas specialized for other linguistic functions such as phonological areas, posterior IFG, supramarginal gyrus, and cognitive control regions of um, domain general relevance, such as the superior parietal lobe. And we found that the level of the individual inhibition at the angular gyrus predicted the upregulation of these neighboring phonological and domain general areas in the SMG and SPL. So the stronger the inhibition of the angular gyrus, the stronger the upregulation of these neighboring regions. And we reasoned that this reflects partial compensatory upregulation of the neighboring phonological network and domain general control regions as an attempt to compensate for the strong disruption. This is, of course, no causal proof. If we were to prove the functional relevance of this reorganization of this upregulation, we would now have to target these reorganized patterns with additional perturbation and see if this further disrupts performance. Now, importantly, the majority of studies with neurostimulation and neuroimaging map the effects at um, the group level only. This was also the case in our previous studies with the univariate analysis. So we recently reanalyzed this data with an MVPA approach. This works work together with Danilo Bjdok from Montreal, and we found that this difference, this shift in the activity pattern after TMS over the angular gyrus from angular gyrus to neighboring supramarginal gyrus could be identified in each individual subject. So in each subject, we observed this change after TMS from angular gyrus activity to neighboring SMG and SPL. And interestingly, we found strong individual differences or individual specific response patterns. And I think that this is interesting because it might have some translational relevance since we see a lot of variation in patient data. And if we were to have such a sensitive measure that could identify changes in the patterns induced by neurostimulation at the individual subject level, this might turn out helpful for therapeutic approaches. Now, based on these and many other studies, mainly with TMS in the healthy brain, I have recently suggested a novel model for flexible redistribution in neural networks for cognition. And this model assumes that compensation for disruption of keynotes can not only take place within a specialized network, but also across different networks. And for across different network compensation, I assume that if a network is decreased in its functional contribution because we target a key node, for instance, with inhibitory neurostimulation, then of course these areas cannot compensate for the disruption. Now, what we may observe is the recruitment of alternative networks. Alternative networks could be neighboring networks for other specialized functions, such as in case of the semantic network disruption, a neighboring phonological network. We also often observe the recruitment of so-called domain general networks. Domain general functions such as attention, working memory, or cognitive control are known to contribute to all higher level cognitive processes such as language. The basic idea is that after disruption of a specialized network, domain general networks may jump in and to some degree compensate for the disruption. I'm not suggesting that they can fully replace a specialized function, which is of course very unlikely, but they can help to maintain task performance at a certain level. And in terms of patients, they may also contribute to successful recovery of function. Now, the 
a key question of my research is the behavioral relevance of the interplay between language-specific and domain-general networks during language processing. And to give you some insight into this question, I will move to the second approach, that is the simultaneous combination of neurostimulation and fMRI to map stimulation, immediate um, stimulation effects. And in this case, we used TDCS during fMRI to map the consequences of potentially facilitatory, that is a nodal stimulation during verb learning. So this was a collaboration with Paola Marangolo's lab from Rome. And um, since we were interested in boosting or improving verb learning, we had to come up with a relatively challenging task. So we used verb learning of low frequent Italian verbs in German speakers without any prior knowledge of the Italian language. And the task was really challenging. So they saw a picture and had to overtly name the correct verb. So in this case, this is something like to blow, so sofiare. And they had repeated combinations of pictures, had to say the verb, and then were provided with visual feedback. The actual learning place uh, took place in the scanner, so directly during fMRI. We did not care about the pronunciation, but they had to name the correct verb. Now, this is what happened during fMRI. We compared anodal TDCS over the left um, IFG, which is associated with verb learning versus sham stimulation. And this was a within design. And you can see that in both sessions, subjects were able to learn. So they were repeatedly presented with the same um, pictures and received feedbacks, feedback and um, were able to learn at a relatively high rate. So 50% does not really mean chance here because they had to come up with the full correct verb, not a binary decision. And you can see that TDCS increased task-related accuracy during the later presentations. Now, the question is, what are the neural correlates of such improvements? You can see here that TDCS decreases the task-related activity during verb learning in a number of regions that are associated with verbal processing and verb learning in particular, including the stimulated left IFG, the contralateral homologous region, and the fusiform gyrus. So it seems that we observed decreased task-related activity under a nodal TDCS in language-specific regions, which likely reflects increased processing efficiency, and which is in line with previous studies that used TDCS in the scanner during different um, verb production and um, comprehension tasks. Now, this is also in line with patient work that shows that after successful language therapy, patients show decreases in task-related activity in the language network. Now, finally, we were also interested in changes in the task-related interactions or connectivity here. And we used a psychophysiological interaction to explore such changes at the whole brain level. As a seed region, we used the stimulated area, that is the left IFG. We found that TDCS induced a decrease in the functional interaction, the effect of connectivity between the targeted area and a region for cognitive control in the right anterior insula. And this change in the functional connectivity was behaviorally relevant because the individual decrease in connectivity between IFG and insula predicted the increase in the task-related accuracy. So the stronger the decrease in the connectivity between both regions, the stronger the increase in individual task-related accuracy. So it seems that anodal TDCS decreases connectivity between language-specific the language specific area and the domain general cognitive control region. And again, this most likely reflects increased processing efficiency or less task effort. And I think this is interesting because it provides some first insight into the relevance of interaction between specialized area, um, areas or specialized language network and domain general areas under increased processing demands. Now, I also want to briefly outline how one can use behavioral modeling to map neurostimulation effects. And I, my example here is with TMS. And one idea is to use drift diffusion models. So a drift diffusion model comes with the advantage that it takes the whole response distribution into account. So we can look at both 
correct and incorrect trials, which increases the amount of trials. And drift diffusion models can be used to map response strategies such as speed accuracy trade-offs. So you can look at the distribution of your responses here illustrated for sham stimulation as a baseline, and you can um, model different parameters. One parameter of interest is the so-called drift rate, which gives you an idea about how fast subject reaches a correct decision. So in this example, this would be a binary decision where one of the decision is a correct response and the other one is an error. And if the drift rate is high, then the time to reach a correct decision is low. So you, this would um, be equivalent to a fast and accurate response. Now, after inhibitory TMS, as illustrated here, the drift rate might be decreased. So lower drift rate may, in, um, uh, may illustrate a prolonged response speed and a higher error rates in your distribution. And since TMS effects are often very subtle, such behavioral modeling approaches might be more sensitive than conventional analysis that rely on composite measures based on mean scores. As another possibility, we also often use mixed models now because they um, provide insights into the individual level distribution and do not um, rely on composite measures at the um, individual level. So um, with these drift diffusion modeling approaches and other behavioral modeling approaches, we ha might have more insights into the specific effects of TMS into changes in response strategies, changes induced, for instance, by so-called recency or primacy effects that you can model. And um, this can be helpful, especially when the effects themselves at the group level are relatively small. And we have used such applications in some of our previous studies. Now, finally, as an outlook, I want to address the way forward or one way forward with neurostimulation combined with neuroimaging. And one way forward is the use um, of network stimulation. And here I'm not referring to the stimulation of several nodes at the same time or subsequently, which is also very interesting. But what I'm currently very interested in is to stimulate densely connected hub regions and map the impact of such stimulation. And one network of particular interest is the default mode network, the so-called task negative network that is also associated with numerous cognitive domains. Previous studies, this is illustrated um, here in this figure from a recent review that I did together with Lucas Falls, where we put together um, or summarized different neuroimaging studies um, on resting state connectivity. And such studies provide insight into single site stimulation of densely connected regions at rest. And what was found so far is um, with respect to the default mode network, it seems that the inferior parietal lobe, so the IPL region, is a particularly interesting candidate that induces, where stimulation induces large scale changes in connectivity at rest across different networks. So changes in connectivity after IPL stimulation, be it facilitatory or inhibitory, are not limited to the default mode network itself, but may also induce changes in other networks and task positive networks, such as the frontal parietal network. Now, such remote stimulation effects across networks are particularly interesting for translational approaches when you read, want to reach um, more than one network and potentially also when you want to reach subcortical structures. However, the behavioral relevance of such effects is so far relatively unclear because the majority of such studies relied on resting state only. So what I'm particularly interested in is the effects of network neurostimulation on task-related activity and connectivity across domains and the association of domain-specific and domain-general effects. And of course, on the long run, I'm also interested in the translational relevance, especially on network stimulation in patients with brain lesions. Now, as a first step towards this aim, Ole Numsen from my lab showed functional specialization within the larger IPL region. So the IPL is not only a key region of the default mode network, but it is also associated with different 
cognitive domains that are key in the human brain, that is attention, social cognition, and language. And what we found here is um, a task-derived parcellation of the larger IPL regions into two subregions in both hemispheres, so an anterior um, region and a posterior region. And now the predictive relevance of the task-related activity in these subregions was different across the domains. We found that the right anterior IPL subregion had the strongest predictive relevance of, for our attention task, whereas the left anterior IPL subregion had the strongest relevance for our semantic language task. Finally, both posterior IPL subregion showed the strongest predictive relevance for a social cognition task. And this functional specialization within the larger region was also found in the task-related connectivity profiles for either domain. So this is an illustration of the social cognition task, where we found that both posterior subregions showed dense task-related connectivity with major networks that have been described at, at rest, other nodes of the default mode network, somatomotor network, dorsal attention network, visual network, and so on. And these connectivity fingerprints were different for the three different domains. And what we're currently doing is um, to use network stimulation to dissociate domain-specific and domain-general effects when we target the different IPL subregions. And I think that this might provide insight also in differences in the adaptive plasticity of each subregion here in the IPL. So to summarize, what did I tell you about modeling NIPS effects in cognition research? I think neural modeling and mapping in the combination of neurostimulation and fMRI and also EEG, which I didn't show here, is very interesting to provide insight into network effects of neurostimulation. So we can map immediate or lasting stimulation effects at the neural network level or the electrophysiological level. We can also explore the potential for flexible adaptation and compensation in neural networks for higher cognitive functions if we apply inhibitory protocols. The immediate network effects and remote effects can be mapped within a specialized network, but also across networks, which I consider particularly interesting. And the advantages of neural and behavioral modeling approaches are that NIPS effects are often very subtle, so behavioral modeling may be more sensitive than relying on standard composite measures based on aggregated mean data. And the same holds true for fMRI and EEG measures, which often shows increased sensitivity for modulatory neurostimulation effects than um, only when we only look at the behavioral level. And changes in task-related activity and connectivity can be related. And of course, we can also explore their relationship with behavior, which is um, very interesting and can provide new insight into the way the brain works during cognition. And finally, I think the way forward is to use network stimulation via hub region. And of course, network stimulation also applying targeted neurostimulation at several nodes, which I did not talk about here. And Key areas for network stimulation approach may, for instance, be in the default mode network, this densely connected um, network that is also active at rest, but also contributes to different key cognitive domains for human cognition. And with, with this, I'm at the end of my talk. I thank you for your attention. Please don't hesitate to email me if you have any questions. Thank you.